So this video is going to go through problems three and the first part of problem four from our second packet of rotational dynamics problems. I strongly suggest you try both of those on your own and then come back to the video to see how I solve it, giving you some hints along the way. Again, problems three and only part A of problem four. Okay, so what's happening here in problem three? Well, we have this rod that's hanging from a frictionless hinge. If we just swing back and forth, we got this block coming along. It's going to hit it right at the end of the rod. That's really important that it hits right at the end of the rod. And the block continues going on this frictionless surface. The rod then swings upwards, and we're going to find its uh, angular speed at the instant after the collision. Obviously, it's going to slow down as it rises. We're really focusing on the moment immediately after the collision. So, of course, this is going to be a conservation sort of problem. The question is, what's being conserved? Well, the clue here, of course, is that the rod rotates. So we're obviously talking about a rotational kinetic energy, which then talks about an angular momentum, right? And so now we're thinking about conservation of angular momentum. So let's set it up as such. That's going to be the starting angular momentum in the system equals the final angular momentum in the system. Now, we're talking about B for block and R for rod. Why does the block have an angular momentum? Well, this is the idea of the orbital angular momentum, right? That if we use the hinge of the rod as the pivot point, the block is going past it, tracing out some sort of change in angle. This is very similar to when I gave you the example of me standing in the doorway watching the student pass by in the hallway. And though it's a bit of a strange idea considering the block is not rotating, but it is going somehow past an axis. And so it does have an angular momentum with regard to that point. Which equation should we use for angular momentum? Well, for the rod, it should be pretty obvious. It's an extended object, and so it's going to be L equals I omega. But what about for the block? It's not, it, is it an extended object? Well, it's kind of far away from the axis of rotation, right? And so let's imagine it's relatively small compared to the overall geometry. That should give you a big clue which equation we're supposed to be using. Yeah, it's not L equals I omega, it's going to be L equals RP sine theta. So let's do this. We'll say RP sine theta for the original motion of the block coming in is RP prime sine theta for the block, block's motion after the collision, and then I omega prime for the angular momentum of the rod. Sometimes I rearrange first, sometimes I don't. What will, oh, what will angle theta be? Let's talk about that for a second, right? So remember, theta actually changes if you draw the position vector from the axis of rotation over where the block is, but we did prove that the moment arm doesn't change. R sine theta and R prime, when it's perpendicular, ends up being the same thing. So in this case, theta is going to be 90 degrees. We just make it the easiest possible situation. And so we're going to solve this, assuming theta is 90 degrees, so sine theta is 1. We're going to solve this for omega prime. I pulled R and M to the outside, replaced P with MV, and pulled R M to the outside. So it's just V prime minus V over I. Let's go ahead and calculate moment of inertia. Certainly you could combine equations if you'd like to, but I find that makes an algebra kind of messy. So which moment of inertia equation should we be using for the rod? Well, it is pivoted about one end. So if you don't quite remember what that is, go ahead and look it up on the chart. So this is going to be the one-third ml squared, where m is the mass of the rod. What's l? L is the whole length of the rod. So if you didn't go ahead and calculate that yet, why don't you just go ahead and do that, just so we can get a checkpoint here. We should be getting 0.0188 kilogram meters squared. That's going to go in for moment of inertia. What should go in for r, though? Well, r, remember, is like that distance of closest approach when the block is right here at the bottom of the rod, which means that r, the distance between the hinge and where the block is, is the full length of the rod. So in this case, r is going to be 0 0.750 meters. Now it's just a matter of putting everything in the right place. Make sure you will get the final answer of 1.68 radians per second. <laughs> On to part B, you want to find the change in kinetic energy of the system. It's a collision. There's usually a loss of energy unless it's a completely elastic collision. That's very, very rare. And so we want to find the final kinetic energy and the initial kinetic energy. But first we have to figure out what sort of energies we're talking about. So in the final situation, well, we've got the block moving and the rod is rotating, right? And so that's going to be a translational kinetic energy for the block and a rotational kinetic energy for the rod. Notice again, as I pointed out before, that I'm putting the prime quantities in parentheses. It's a matter of notation, but I think it makes the most sense to do that, even though it's a bit cumbersome, because if you don't, then the prime on the V and the prime on the omega can get very close to the 2 and the exponents. And then, you know, if you're really rushing through things, you might say, oh, it's an exponent of 12. I don't think anyone really would say that, but it really just declutters it here if we put the parentheses around it. It makes everything very, very specific. How about for the initial kinetic energy? Well, the rod is at rest. So we just have the translational kinetic energy of the block. 
So I'll give you a couple checkpoints to make sure you're on the right track here. We should be getting 0 0.203 joules for the final, 0 0.397 joules for the initial. And of course, we have a loss of energy, as often happens in collisions. If you were to qualify this, which would this be? Elastic, inelastic, or perfectly inelastic? Well, obviously, there's a loss of kinetic energy, so it's not elastic. And the objects don't stick together, so it's not perfectly inelastic. This would be the rotational equivalent of an inelastic collision. Letter C is a really important question, but I don't want to answer it here. I really want to see what you think about this, so we will discuss this together in class. On to problem four. So problem four has one disc that's already rotating, another disc that's not rotating is dropped onto it, and then they combine together as one big system. So as we sort of seen before with the child jumping on the carousel, this is the rotational equivalent of a perfectly inelastic collision. Objects are combining. When one disc drops onto the other, the frictional torque between them causes them to join together and move off in that sense or rotate off as one object. So of course, it's going to be conservation of angular momentum, but it, it's again sort of just one object here. This is very similar to the figure skater problem we had done. So we could write this as I omega equals I prime omega prime. It is a disk, so we know the moment of inertia is going to be one half mr squared, but just make sure we are using the symbols. I know it's a little bit annoying to do so, but we do want to call it m1 and r1. So we have a lot of subscripts involved here. So the initial, the angular momentum of the original system here is just the one disk, but the next one is two of them combined, which is just twice the moment of inertia, because our moment of inertia is sort of like mass, it's just additive, and so this is what it would look like. Of course, just by looking at this, realizing they had the same moment of inertia, you maybe just immediately figured out that we can cross pretty much everything off except for the factor of two, and so omega prime equals half omega. This would be like one cart at rest and a second cart coming along with a certain speed. They join up together, and if they have the same masses, then of course the final speed will just be half the initial speed because the momentum must be must be shared among the objects. So that's what's happening here in a rotational sense. The angular momentum is shared, and so the new rotational speed is just half the original because in effect, the rotational mass double. Now we need to find the change in kinetic energy. So we've got to break it down, final and initial, right? And so the initial, of course, is one half i omega squared. And here we just have to do some very careful algebra, making sure you account for everything. It's usually the halves where things go wrong. So there's a half in the equation, and this can be a half in moment of inertia. And look at this. We just have to be very, very careful that we keep track of all those halves. I was about to say, look at the half in the omega prime. That's not until the after situation. So obviously, we don't want to do that just yet. Sorry about that. Okay, so we have a half on the outside. We have half on the parentheses. And they're just keep, keep track of everything. So we should have a quarter M1R1 squared omega squared. How about for the final? Well, they're combined. So we have the new moment of inertia, which is twice the original moment of inertia. So make sure we have that two in there. We have a half in the equation. We have a half moment of inertia. And now we have the half in omega, because we're going to place omega prime with half omega. Just make sure we square everything, right? So let's be really, really careful with the algebra. I'll take account for all of those halves. So here's the half from the equation. Here's the half from moment of inertia. Here's the half from the new rotational speed. I'm using very liberal use of parentheses here. In the end, if you did everything correctly, you should be getting one eighth m one r one squared omega squared. Okay, now we're just taking the difference between these terms. Obviously, they they have the same quantity here. It's just going to be one quarter minus one eighth minus one quarter because we have to finalize initial, and one eighth minus one quarter is of course negative one eighth. And so here's our end results. It loses this amount of kinetic energy in this perfectly inelastic rotational collision. Letter B is a similar idea now, except we're changing the second disk, so it has half the mass and half the radius, so obviously things change. I'm not going to go through all of the solution here. Instead, I'm just going to present you with the answers. I'll leave it as an exercise to you if you'd like to try it. It's really just an exercise in algebra and keeping careful track of all the terms. So here's our results. The omega prime is 8 ninths omega, and the change of kinetic energy is negative 136, and 1 R1 squared omega squared.